A measure keeping potentially dangerous chemicals out of the Hudson River. Passing the legislature as it waits for the governor's signature. We'll speak with a lawmaker on the background for this legislation and what happens next. Hello and welcome to Empire State Weekly. I'm John Gray in Albany. In the final days of their legislative session, the Assembly passed a bill to block environmental company Holtec from dumping nuclear waste into the Hudson River. Legislation came after environmental advocates argued that dumping wastewater into the river carried the risk of letting cancer-causing isotopes into that water. The dumping was part of the decommissioning of the Indian Point Power Plant, which is in Westchester County. The legislation calls for the chemical to be held in tanks to decompose instead. We really want it to be safe, we want it to be secure, and we want to be sure that our neighborhoods, that our water, that our Hudson River remains clean and as pristine as possible. And that's why we really want, really want to make sure that nothing bad gets dumped into the Hudson if there are other alternatives. Uh, Holtec argues, though, that they have a valid permit to discharge the chemicals into the river and that those discharges are monitored for safety. Uh, joining us now is uh, State Senator uh, Pete Harkin talking about this important issue. Uh, Senator, welcome to the show. Thanks so much for having me. Uh, the first, my first thought when I, I heard about your bill was this, is, this already isn't illegal. Explain what the bill is and what it hopes to do. Well, we're going undergoing a decommissioning in the nuclear power plant, Indian Point, uh, located in Buchanan, New York, about 45 miles north of New York City. And part of that, and, and what's been happening for years, actually, is the release of water, contaminated water, from the spent fuel pool into the Hudson River. Uh, and under Nuclear Regulatory Commission guidelines, this is considered perfectly acceptable. Uh, when the public found out that this has been standard operating practice, there was, there was an outcry. I've never seen anything like this. 30 municipalities, five members of Congress, um, five different county executives of different parties have rallied behind this. And essentially what it says is that this would do um, economic harm to the Hudson River. We've spent countless generations and millions of dollars cleaning up the Hudson. Many municipalities have staked their resurgence on being along the Hudson River. Uh, and so we aim to stop um, the, the discharge of tritiated water into the Hudson with this bill. Yeah, you know, that was my first thought was of uh, of all things General Electric. I, I'm old enough to remember when, you know, they were legally allowed to put PCBs uh, in the Hudson, but, you know, the change of circumstances, we get more information, we, we grow as a society, perhaps, and lawmakers, and you just say, wait, you, you got to guys got to go back and clean that up. And they were forced, uh, you know, to, to spend a lot of money, I, I have to believe it was billions, to do all of that. And we, we finally get the river where it's, uh, it's cleaner, if not clean, but and now this happens. It, it didn't make sense to me that this would even be allowed. Is this federal that is allowing this? And does the this state is, have no This is federal oversight. The NRC oversees um, radiological discharges. Um, and this has been going on for decades. It's been going on when Con Ed owned the plant, when Entergy owned the plant. It's currently happening in Lake Ontario and the nuclear plants. So this legislation and the outcry from the public um, represents a sea change in values. And, and it says that, you know, we're not going to use our, our waterways as dumping grounds for industrial waste. That's something from the industrial era. As you said, we've evolved. We've moved beyond that. And, and we've got to think of a better way to do this. Now, can the feds bigfoot you on this and say, look, federal uh, over, overrides anything the state wants to do? Or can the state pass a law like this, like you're trying to get through and say, well, no, you don't. It's our, it's our river running through our communities and we get, to, we have a say in this. Well, if we, if we tried to do it on health grounds, then the NRC and the federal government could overrule us. What we're saying is this will cause irreparable economic harm to the Hudson River Valley. And the Ninth Circuit Court in California upheld that that's something that the states have the right to do. And of course, we as, as state representatives have to do all we can to protect our environment and our economic vitality. You know, growing up in South Troy, my, my father, we used to fish a canal that fed off the river. We were always told, go, you can go fish, but don't keep it, throw it back. You never want to eat a fish out of the Hudson. When I, you know, I'm 60 years old, so this would have been 50 years ago. Can you eat fish out of the Hudson? Is it, is it clean enough even right now? Where Are we still working on getting it clean and we don't need this issue right now with more stuff going in the water? In, in my district, people swim in the Hudson they paddleboard in the Hudson, they kayak in the Hudson. 
um, and people fish all the time in the Hudson. The Hudson um, has been, is responsible for hundreds of thousands of jobs, as I, we mentioned before, uh, because of the economic resurgence around the Hudson River, and that's why we're doing this. What would they have to do if they, if, you, if you win this, if they get this bill passed and signed, uh, what would they do with this this wastewater, for lack of a better word? Would they have to truck it somewhere and dispose of it like you would in a, in a, in a landfill somewhere or something along those lines? Yeah, there, there are a couple options. One is solidification, mixing it with clay and then taking it to the southwest where it would be used as a cap in, in a radiological dump. Um, one of the suggestions is to store it on site for 12 years, which is a half-life of tritium, and then release it. Uh, what they did Three Mile Island was evaporation, although there's some issues there because if the tritium is going up into the atmosphere, it's coming down in the water. So we recognize that there are no easy solutions here. Uh, we go in with our, our eyes wide open, but we need to have the conversation uh, about what the alternatives are. Uh, this would seem to be an issue that would get broad support. Do you have broad support or is there is there another side saying, no, we have to allow this? Well, we, we have broad political support. This passed in the Senate, 62 to nothing. And as you know, nothing passes unanimously in the Senate. As we said, over 30 municipalities, every member of the Hudson Valley congressional delegation, two U.S. senators. So, so there is broad support. Um, however, we, we do recognize that this may impact the schedule of decommissioning. And, and that's one of the issues that's been raised uh, by the decommissioning company, and and that's that's fair. Um, so yeah, there there are two sides. You know, one is the schedule and the rapid decommissioning, and the other is how do we protect the economic vitality of the Hudson? Do you know where the assembly is and the governor is on this issue? Have they uh, publicly taken a stance or? Well, the assembly it passed um, oh. by a wide margin. It was not unanimous, but it passed by a wide margin. And now we're urging the governor to call the bill and sign it. It's time sensitive. You know, the plan was calling for uh, this release as early as August, maybe September. Uh, so we're urging the governor to call the bill as soon as possible. And last minute, it, this doesn't sound like something if, if you allowed this and you got it wrong, whereas it did cause some harm in the Hudson River. It's, it's hard to reverse that, isn't it? Well, it, it's the values, too. You know, you're right. Um, measure twice, cut once. Uh, and as we've discussed, we've spent millions of dollars and generations cleaning up the Hudson. So much of the economic vitality of the lower Hudson Valley communities are tied actually to the Hudson, and we want to continue to grow that prosperity. All right. Well, we'll, we'll see if the governor does uh, follow your lead and sign this bill. State Senator Pete Harcum, uh, enjoy your summer, perhaps on the Hudson River. You'll be enjoying part of that summer. Thank you. You too. Thanks for having me. A new federal law now in effect looking to increase protections for expected mothers in the workforce. When we come back, we'll hear from a legal expert on these new protections and how they will protect the soon-to-be moms. Welcome back to Empire State Weekly. I'm John Gray in Albany. Pregnant women in the workforce now have additional protections from their employers. A new federal law requiring jobs to provide reasonable accommodations to employees with limitations due to their pregnancy. The Pregnant Workers Fairness Act mandates that employers offer accommodations for pregnant workers, such as longer break times for eating or using the restroom, flexible work schedules, and leave for medical appointments that are related to the pregnancy. As one advocate explains, this law benefits pregnant employees by ensuring they do not have to choose between their job and their health. And what we were seeing is that pregnant and postpartum workers were being pushed off the job because employers really didn't understand when they needed to accommodate pregnant and postpartum workers. So you had workers that were being forced to choose between keeping their jobs and maintaining a healthy pregnancy. Joining us now to give additional details on how this new law will impact both the employers and the employees, we're joined by Ryan McCall, an attorney with Tully Rinke. Uh, Ryan, thanks for coming on the show again. Thank you for having me. Let's talk about this law. Now, 
Does this kind of echo or duplicate uh, the federal law with, with what's happening in the state? We already, are, what were our protections already, or is, it, or is it different in some way? So it is different in some way. The overarching message that I've been giving to my clients is if you're a resident of New York State, you're really not going to notice any major changes or really all that many minor changes. The good news is with the new law now, you have protections for reasonable accommodations. So what I've been telling my clients is if it's a situation where, say, you need an extra doctor's appointment, say if you're a pregnant person and you need to leave work for 30, 45 minutes once every other week, they now have to give you an accommodation of that level. Now there are certain limitations to it, such as say you work heavy construction and you say I'm, not, I'm no longer able to lift heavy objects, that can somewhat go beyond the reasonable accommodation level. So it's really somewhat about finding that middle ground. So if you do have something like that where you have to lift heavy things, they don't by law have to reassign you to something where you don't do that? or is, is it more of a, a courtesy if they do that? It's really dependent on the situation. So say you're somebody who was working with working heavy construction, lifting heavy objects, and there's other employment that you can do for the company, they should do their best to be able to move you to a spot where you're not doing that. Again, it usually depends on the situation. Say you're a smaller employer where it's, you know, this is all we really have for you. We can't just take you off the job because then effectively we don't have somebody to fill that role. Right. That would be beyond the level of a reasonable accommodation. But little things such as extended bathroom breaks, extended doctor's appointments, maybe having to leave work a little bit early here and there, that's going to be protected. Is there any kind of, this may not be, it may not be a question you can answer, is there any kind of education component to this to educate employers or is just the laws change and they, they sort of need to educate themselves and look, we, we have to make these accommodations? As of right now, there isn't necessarily anything laying out the foundation. What I've been telling every person who's affected by this, employer or employee, reach out to an attorney. Like I said, if you're somebody in New York State, you're really not going to notice any of the differences, but you always want to make sure. You always want to keep yourself buttoned up so nobody's exposed to liability. And there shouldn't be, I would think, any retaliation, right? If you say, look, I, I, I need to take these appointments where maybe now your work's being taken away from mm -hmm. you. I can't rely on you because you're always walking out of the office, using your pregnancy to not be here. That's not allowed either, I would guess, under this law. Absolutely not. And that's already previously protected under the New York State Division of Human Rights as well as the EEOC. And um, what do you say to somebody who thinks that they might be discriminated against here? Do you, do you look to an attorney? Do you look to talk to the boss first or HR and say, look, I know there's a law to protect me and I feel like, you know, I'm not being, or I'm even being given the, the dirty looks or the comments, you know, that kind of thing. I usually think it's circumstantial. So if it's a situation where you feel comfortable talking to your boss or you feel comfortable talking to HR, I always recommend trying to have those conversations and be proactive. However, there are certain situations where people don't feel comfortable talking to their boss or HR. And if that's a situation, I always recommend reaching out to an attorney because they're going to be the ones who can really point you in the right way and tell you, hey, is this valid or this might not be as valid as you think it is. I, I know I've talked to people in other, in other circumstances where they, they've found out the hard way. HR isn't always your best friend sometimes at a company. They, they're not there just to, they're not your lawyer, right? They're not there to protect you. They're they're there to work for the company and everything's not always confidential, correct, with HR? Correct. Usually things are supposed to be confidential. However, there are certain exceptions where people within the company who aren't necessarily HR have access to information just based on the circumstances. However, I always tell everybody, if you don't feel comfortable talking to HR, that's really when you should consider escalating it. Either go talk to your boss, maybe talk to your manager if they're higher than HR, right? But again, if you don't feel comfortable, I never recommend having the conversation. And then at that point, you can engage an attorney to be able to point you in the right direction. How important is documenting, if you have an issue, documenting what's going on in terms of emails or writing down dates and times and comments? I would imagine if you get to a point where a lawyer like yourself gets involved, one of the first things you say is, is there any substantiation for any of this? Absolutely. Documentation is always key, especially in these situations. I tell all of my clients right from the beginning, keep a log. Again, somebody makes a snarky comment, that could be the start of something, right? And you want to make sure as time goes on, you can at least say, hey, listen, I took this log down on the first day of January when somebody said something to me, and this was the beginning, and then I noticed it became a repetitive pattern. You writing down that log or you printing out those emails, things like that, as long as your company handbook allows it, I always recommend doing it. Uh, nobody wants to be a tattletale. We're all taught that when we're in kindergarten. However, I could see where the boss allows, you know, allows the accommodation, but coworkers now are being resentful or making comments. Mm -hmm. How do you deal with something like that? How would you advise a client in that regard? 
I always do your best to walk the straight and narrow. You can't always deal with a coworker who says something that you may not necessarily like, but if it does arise to the level of harassment, you do have rights. And I understand nobody wants to be a tattletale, but to a certain extent, if you're facing discrimination and it's impacting your ability to do your job, I recommend escalating it. And this is discrimination, right? It's, that's a big word. People think, well, mm -hmm. they didn't hire somebody because they were black, that's discrimination, mm -hmm. or didn't give uh, somebody uh, a raise they paid her, her much less than him, that'd be payroll discrimination. But this is also falls under that, that guideline, right? It is if you're uh, not, not allowing someone to be seven months pregnant or go see a doctor. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it could be dangerous to skip those appointments. Absolutely. And again, these are things that really are protected under New York State, which is why you're really not, not going to notice all that much of a change. However, for those in states where there may not necessarily be that protection, they now have a voice where they can say, listen, under this act, I am protected and I'm allowed to do this. This is a reasonable accommodation and you need to accommodate me. And if your employer fails to do that, then they're now in violation of federal law. Is it surprising you it took this long, 2023, to get the whole country on board? We, we've had this for some time now, I would assume. I always think in situations like this, it is difficult. Different states obviously have different mindsets, as with states like New York, which has some of the largest workers for, or largest protections for pregnant workers in the United States. It's always going to be a factor, but I think really now in 2023, you're really beginning to see people come to the idea of these are protections we need to protect our workers. And uh, last question, a chance for you to kind of pitch your, yourself or your firm. Mm -hmm. um, if someone really is having an issue at work, it, it, it never hurts to call an attorney and say, can I pick your brain or get a, you know, maybe pay a consultation fee and sit down with you and tell you what's going on at work and see if I have a case or if maybe I'm, it's all my imagination, you know? Absolutely, and I always recommend anybody who's feeling that sentiment, feel free to reach out to me. The firm I work for, we provide excellent representation for people who are facing this type of discrimination, and we can help get you where you need to go. I would also think, too, sometimes, uh, let's say somebody hires you, you send a letter, suddenly now the boss is paying attention. Now it's like, wait, whoa, whoa, we don't need to end up in court here. Let's, let's solve this problem today. Does that happen with you where it just takes a matter of a little saber rattling saying, look, we're serious about this if we don't accommodate, and then they snap to it? Absolutely. I tell everybody a lot of times drafting a demand letter can go a long way. You're now letting your employer know you're here to play. I'm not joking around. This is a serious issue. I need these accommodations. You're not providing them to me. Here's a letter demanding this, and if you don't do it, we're going to take this to the next step. And they also can't just suddenly uh, eliminate your position a month later after a complaint like this, right? That would also fall under retaliation? Absolutely. And at that point, if you're in New York State, I definitely would recommend filing a complaint with the New York State Division of Human Rights or the EEOC. All right, Ryan McCall, thank you for coming. Tully Runke, appreciate you coming in. Thank you for having me. Much appreciated. Absolutely. Uh, working to bring a better internet access to the state. Uh, that's the goal of a new program. And federal funding is coming here to New York State. Details on how much the state will be getting. Welcome back to Empire State Weekly. I'm John Gray in Albany. Senator Chuck Schumer announcing this week that New York is set to receive a massive investment to enhance the state's high-speed internet. Over $664 million being allocated as part of the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act. The funding will be used to produce broadband to areas that are underserved with internet access. This investment is just a fraction of the $42 billion in federal money aimed at increasing internet access all throughout the country. Broadband is no longer a luxury, it's a necessity, as I said. It's like electricity. And in the 1930s, Franklin D. Roosevelt said every home should have electricity. We're saying every home should have broadband, and this money goes a long way to making that happen in New York State. Primary elections happening across the state this week as the election season begins. One bill passed this session in the Assembly would change the way campaigns are being financed. Now, the measure adopted late in the session proposes changing how the state matches the campaign donations. Currently, only donations of up to $250 are matched by the state. Supporters say this change would empower smaller donors, while opponents argue that it would not make a difference. Small donors are far drowned out by the largest campaign donors in state elections. Um, we found that in 2022, just 200 wealthy mega donors outgave all 206,000 small donors combined in New York State. While this measure has passed the assembly, it has not gotten through the Senate. Stick around, we'll be back uh, with a look at the week ahead in just a moment.
By the way, if you have a comment or story idea, let us know about it. You can email us at news at news10.com. You can also reach out on Twitter. You'll find us at WTEN. Finally in Empire State Weekly, the Supreme Court has struck down affirmative action in college admissions. In a 6-3 decision, the court ruled colleges will not be able to consider race when reviewing a potential student. The measure has existed since the 1960s as part of an effort to promote diversity on campus. Next week, we'll keep an eye on the latest legal fallout and hear expert analysis. We're also continuing to follow the response to the asylum seekers arriving here in New York State. As the legislature passes measures that would provide health insurance for migrants, a new Siena research poll shows 54% of New Yorkers oppose temporarily housing those migrants on a SUNY campus. Next week, we'll talk with an immigration law expert on the latest challenges from upstate counties to accepting these migrants. For now, from all of us here on Empire State Weekly, I'm John Gray in Albany. We'll see you right here next week. And don't forget, you can watch Empire State Weekly all over New York State. Here's the full schedule of Empire State Weekly on 10 television stations across this great state of New York.